This afternoon, Frank and I are going to be leaving to go and visit Frank's parents in Calgary, Alberta. It's just 10 or 11 more hours until the first round of hugs and kisses start. We haven't seen his brothers and his sister and his parents for more than a year. And best of all, midweek, my son will be joining us there, and I can hardly wait to put my hand on his cheek and stand on my tippy toes to kiss him. <laughs> Welcome homes are simply wonderful, but the end of the week is going to be a little bit tougher. The goodbyes, they're a little harder. Because it's going to be another year before I see these people again. And that means another year of emails and checking up on Facebook and another year of weekly phone calls and another year of prayers. Prayers thanking God for their good health and prayers that they'll remain safely in his care. There'll likely be tears at both ends. Tears of joy when we arrive and tears of sadness when we depart. As worshipping Christians, we prefer the hellos over the goodbyes, don't we? Consider how many people were here for the hello of Christmas, or even the hello of Easter, as compared to today, when it's about the goodbye of Ascension. Or maybe people aren't here today because ascension is just too fantastic. Jesus lifting off in a cloud and ascending into heaven seems improbable. For many of us in the 21st century, up is not where heaven is as strongly as up is where heaven was for the people of the first century. School children, in fact, can name the layers of Earth's atmosphere, the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the lonosphere, and they don't mention heaven at all. When we look up at night, we see a slice of the Milky Way. That's the galaxy that our solar system is part of, and beyond that, there are millions of other galaxies in that swirling, creative force of chaos in our whole universe. Now you can log on, you can go home this afternoon and log on to the computer and go to nasa.org and you could see pictures of those other galaxies, but you're not going to see a picture of heaven. But the good news is that our Bible isn't an astronomy textbook. Our Bible is many books. It's a collection of books that tell us life truths. So what's the point of Jesus' ascension? What's the message for the disciples? What's the meaning in ascension for us today? The resurrection stories about Jesus eating with his disciples and appearing in locked rooms and saying to Thomas, come on, touch my wounds, they're there to tell us of the reality of resurrection. The 40 days gave the disciples an opportunity to interpret the suffering and death and resurrection as part of the kingdom of God, as part of the power of God. And the 40 days gave Jesus a further opportunity to teach his disciples to continue to open the scriptures to them. The 40 days gave Christ time to commission them Luke says that he, that, um, no, to commission them to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins, that, is, that it is open to people everywhere. And then he instructed them to wait for the Holy Spirit, to wait for God's divine power to baptize them, and then, then they could go and spread the gospel everywhere. So next week when you come back, you'll hear um, Pastor Sandy Knapp preach on the Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit. Forty days after Jesus escaped the grave, he rose up into the heavens. He overcame both gravity, the force that holds us on the earth, and gravity, he overcame death and the grave. His ascension 
was the completion of his resurrection. The disciples would learn from this series of events that they no longer would have direct physical contact with Jesus. If they hadn't had a chance to witness his going, there would have been as many Jesus sightings in Jerusalem as Elvis sightings in Vegas. When I was searching for images for our bulletin, there were numerous interpretations of Jesus' leaving, from magnificent gold leaf illuminations in Bibles from 1025, to really edgy, kind of electronic, computer-generated representations. On the back of your bulletin, the painting by Salvador Dali, known for his offbeat viewpoints, shows the bottom of Jesus' feet. And it kind of makes me feel abandoned. Then there was another video that I really connected to when I was doing research for this Sunday. And it, it, just, it showed this portion of Jesus' life. And he's walking and talking with his disciples and opening the scriptures to him. And it, it just made me feel like our Tuesday mornings when we walk around this neighborhood and we talk about the scriptures. And then Jesus begins to leave the disciples and, and he starts to raise up. But instead of an up view from the disciples, it's Jesus looking back. And the disciples are shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And it makes me wonder if Jesus had a bucket list. Did he get to do everything on it? It makes me wonder if his last thoughts were, I wonder if they got it. I wonder if they're going to do it. I wonder if they will share the good news. Jesus' final instructions were to lead, to receive the Holy Spirit and then to be witnesses for Christ's messages of repentance and forgiveness to the ends of the earth. If you read carefully, you'll notice that in Luke, the 12 that he gathers around him are called disciples. But in the book of Acts, also written by Luke, the 11 that he leaves are called apostles. Disciples are people who follow their students. Apostles are people sent to go and tell the good news. However, the disciples' last question was whether it was now time, finally, to restore the political power to Israel. We get caught up in that muddle of misunderstanding, too. And we start to measure the size of our denomination. Our churches are good if they have a lot of stained glass windows or a lot of people in the pews. Now certainly, people in the pews and size of denomination is a representation about the work we do. But sometimes it can become the goal and then we lose sight of the opportunity of actually opening other people's hearts to the love of Christ. We can also be distracted from that goal of sharing the good news by trying to cleanse the world and the society of all that is wrong. But Jesus did not leave us with a sword. He left us with bread and wine, and he came to show us how to serve others. There's a second message, too, also taught through the disciples' behavior. Well, they are staring up at heaven, trying to get the last glimpse of Jesus, looking for direction in the clouds. Two men in white robes ask, what are you doing standing around, standing at the sky? It's ironic that they were staring at the clouds for direction when God's messengers were already standing right beside them on earth. God's work continues on earth, and we are the ones doing it with the power of the Holy Spirit. This scene stands as a warning for us not to get our lost because our heads are in the clouds. Karl Marx accused religious people of being too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. He said, religion is the opiate of the masses. Christian faith drugs people's minds with visions of a better tomorrow in the sweet by and by. 
The resulting heavenly stupor renders peoples worthless for social action as they think to themselves, why make this world better when our true home is elsewhere anyway? There is an element of truth in that statement. Some Christians willingly opt out of the loop in favor of hyper-spirituality, and it's fueled by Bible study and a life-shunning lifestyle, a world-shunning lifestyle. So how are we to spend our time here on the earth? What do you, how, what do you, how do you conceive of that time? Are our days on earth just a trial to slog through, to test us? Is our time on earth a time of judgment to see whether we're worthy to go to heaven? Think about this. God's spirit is still here with us. We don't have to look for it in some remote location. God intends for us not only to survive, but to flourish. God intends to be, for us to be committed to this world here and now. Once humanity didn't fully understand that. And Jesus had to come and teach us that, to show us how to love like God loves. But now God's messengers are all over the world, reminding us that we too are witnesses and messengers, called to teach and show others that love. Ascension <coughs> marks the beginning of that change. Pentecost confirms it. Up to this point, the Gospel according to Luke has been about what God in Christ has done for us. The ways in which Jesus liberates and heals and restores us, but from Ascension Day onward, the letters and the acts become about what God in Christ is doing through us in the world. Ascension marks the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, but it prepares the way for the birth of the church with the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. As I told the children, each voyage includes a goodbye at one end 